Where does the black experience in Minnesota begin? And then that's when we found the houses. Tribal historian Jim Jones has found clues on the shores of Leech Lake. This may have been the site of a trading post of the famous black fur trader named George Bonga. In a village near the confluence of Lake Superior and the St. Louis River, an Ojibwe woman married Pierre Bonga, a black fur trader. Their children, including son George Bonga, born around 1802, would be the first known people of African ancestry born in Minnesota. In the early 1800s, the fur trade was the heartbeat of the heartland. Along with the fur trapping Native Americans and the fur companies, there were the legendary voyageurs. Engagés, voyageurs, were basically the truck drivers of the fur trade. They paddled the canoes, they hauled the goods, they built the posts, they did the hunting, they did all the, the labor. Known for songs as colorful as their dress, the voyageurs drove the area's culture and commerce. After attending school in Montreal, George Bonga began work in the fur trade like his father, Pierre Bonga, and his grandfather, Jean Bonga, before him. He knew how to get around in the country, where the best routes were, where you could portage from one place to another, where a good place for a, for a post would be. He was a huge man, I mean, big, <laughs> by even contemporary standards, and a powerful man. There's one account that he portaged 700 pounds. They were human machines and men who were strong, who put up with hardships day in and day out, were valued. And most of them wore out pretty fast. It was a lifestyle that used people up. But not Bonga, although his longevity in the business was due to more than just brute strength. He had to be a, somewhat of an intellect. Um, one, he was very skilled in languages. He was um, educated in Montreal. Um, so he did not come to the frontier um, without skills, without intellectual attributes. He was an entrepreneur as well. In 1838, George Bonga received his license to trade. As a trader clerk for the American Fur Company, Bonga eventually ran a post on Leech Lake, where he would have a home for the rest of his life. The experience of the French Indian Métis and the few early black settlers suggests that, in these early days of Minnesota, race was often irrelevant. This was the frontier, which meant the survival was key. And in a frontier, you don't have the luxury to discriminate. And so it was possible to find all kinds of, of, of roles that black people could fill and uh, all kinds of identities that they could acquire for themselves. Native people identified anybody who didn't live in their way, whether they're Dakota or Ojibwe people, as white people. Bonga's part of that as, as in his work as a, as a trader. He claims to, he and another man claimed to have been the first two white men in the country in the area they were trading with the Ojibwa, but not, not as a white man racially, but as a participant in, in European culture. So the notion of, of color and race is fluid. George Bonga knew Ojibwa. His mother was Ojibwa, he had an Ojibwa wife. George, like his brother Stephen, used this multicultural background to work as a diplomat translator. Both the Bonga brothers' signatures can be found on major treaties between the United States and sovereign tribes. And that's no easy place to be um, because you had to be trusted by both sides. Bonga's Cultural Balancing Act did strain his relations with his mother's people. In 1837, the trading post of William Atkins was robbed. Atkins' son was killed in the raid. A member of the Pillager Ojibwe was the prime suspect. George Bonga tracked the accused killer through the Minnesota winter for days. He finally captured the suspect and brought him to the authorities at Fort Snelling. After his return to his trading post on Leech Lake, Bonga mentioned the tension he encountered. The Indians say, if Chigawas Gung is missing, they will set fire to my store and break my canoes from my part. I don't think they are really in earnest in these words. Despite this, Bonga's standing with the Ojibwe remained good. He eventually started a family at Leech Lake. George married into the Leech Lake band. He took a wife 
from the Anigam community here. He accepted them. They accepted him. We find in history, there was a certain element of trust that seemed to exist between native peoples and people of African descent. The black pioneer gained the respect of many of Minnesota's white founding fathers, and Elder Bonga used his legendary status to advocate for Native Americans who were being pushed further into the realm of the reservation. In the late 1860s, letters he wrote to government officials revealed his contempt for corrupt government Indian agents. Respected sir, I am really sorry to have to say that I have lost all hopes in Major Clark. It is a disgrace to the government to have such an agent. I have not hesitated to make known to you my opinion in the matter of great importance to the Indians and the people of the frontier, hoping that the Great Spirit will so guide our ways that we may meet again and have another good campfire talk. I remain yours, George Bonka. I mean, he was a man of substance. He was one of the forefathers of the state, one of the pioneers. Bonga died at Leech Lake in 1874. He and his siblings had several children who continued to have experiences that spoke to their unique heritage. George's daughter, Susie Bonga, had been a rising leader among the Ojibwe women of Leech Lake. But white racism towards blacks began to influence some Native Americans, which presented obstacles for Susie Bonga. Photos of son William Bonga, one as deputy, the other as tribal delegate to Washington, seemed to capture the Bonga's cultural crossroads. Two hundred years after the birth of George Bonga, conversations on a genealogy website showed the descendants of this pioneer family are still pondering their unique background. Along with their living legacy, namesake landmarks with variations on the spelling of the family name dot the land in Cass County. To me, that's his, this is his place. Jim Jones and others continue to make discoveries that help unravel the story of the Bongas and Minnesota's pre-territorial history. Yeah, something like that come over. But on this day, the Pillager Band member made another discovery, a brilliant rainbow that appeared over the rough waters of Leech Lake, a colorful connection between two far-off points, just like George Bonga. Welcome everyone. Welcome to our episode two of our educational series by Rotai Reflections of Turtle Island. And we have our elder Ron Williams uh, speak to our audience uh, regarding this week's episode, this month's episode. Well, welcome. And I'm excited to, uh, to begin uh, this second of the series of our monthly educational series uh, uh, by inviting you to uh, join in, uh, relax, uh, uh, join in the discussion if you if you must. Uh, we have a chat line, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, we did. And uh, I'm Ron Williams. I'm the co-founder and president of the uh, Reflections of Turtle Island. This is my wife, Mary. Hello. And uh, enjoy. My name is Les Fry, and I'm with uh, Nate Brown Media and Clip Dive Productions. I'm also a board member, and we have also with us uh, one of our other board members, Mr. Barry Lee. And tonight, we are very excited to have our special guest talking about the past, present, and future of Black Indians. We have uh, Jay Winter Nightwolf with us, and shortly, Mr. Darwin Strong, who is the descendant of George Bonga, uh, the video that we just saw a few minutes ago. So without further ado, let's go ahead and bring in Mr. Nightwolf, and uh, hopefully then Mr. Strong will join us afterwards. Hello, Jay. How are you? How are you? How are you? Thank you. Thank you. Good to see you, too. Um I'm very excited to talk about this specifically because this is something that you and I talk at, uh, it, you know, when I first met Jay, I actually had a conversation with him regarding this when I was working at AT&T and we brought a lot of attention to a little known history that's somewhat of a hidden history between black and indigenous people and the intersection of the two uh, people. So uh, Jay, 
since Darwin is not here, can you just kind of give us just a little bit of history on George Bonga? And then when he does come in, we'll kind of go on a little bit further about George Bonga. George Bonga, Darwin Strong's great, great grandfather was a miraculous man. He was a huge man. He was an educated man. His mom and dad sent him to Canada to get his education. He was an African. And um, if it wasn't for George Bonga and his efforts, Minnesota would have never gotten into the fur trade. And when he got into the fur trade through George Bonga, that was a very big opportunity for Minnesota to become one of the leading states in the fur trade business. A lot of money was made there. Definitely. And one of the things that I think was very important that people understand is that he did not identify as black or African-American, which is typically what most people would identify him as, but he was both African and Ojibwe. He was yes. both black and indigenous. Mm -hmm. So with that being said, uh, it's very interesting because he does not fit phenotypically the appearance of someone who is of mixed heritage. True, very true. But his mind and his skills, uh, he was a diplomat. Definitely, he was a diplomat. And that's the thing, that he walked between two worlds. He literally walked between two worlds. He was the connector between the Europeans because he was educated in Montreal and the Ojibwe people. And he he basically set up alliances between the two so that there would not be so much strife between the two people uh, in this new land that they were now living in. So he's definitely a historic figure. I highly recommend that we find out a little bit more about him, but we have to move on since Darwin isn't here. And let's talk a little bit about the intersection of black and indigenous people and how long that intersection has been going on. Uh, Jake, could you kind of talk a little bit about that? Yes. Over 50,000 years ago, the first black people to come here were the people, the Phoenicians. And as back then, the white man would make you think that they were white merchants. They were not. They were black ocean-going sea merchants from uh, Phoenicia. And they came here to the eastern part of the United States. And some of the tribes, like the people up in the northeast, the Mohawks, the Oneidas, they got involved in international uh, trading with the Phoenicians because they traveled on their large boats with them. And there was no strife or, you know, there was nothing crazy about that. So the first black people that came here were the Phoenicians. So um, I did a little history right here and it said this was 2000 years before Columbus supposedly discovered America, uh, that the Phoenicians found this part of North America, as we know as Turtle Island, by, by, founded by accident because they were seafaring people. Uh, they came to the south coast of Turtle Island and because they were maritime people, they followed the stars here. And you said something that was very important. There was no strife, there was no warring. It was more of a trade, uh, um, an exchange between two cultures going back and forth, a giving of, two, uh, of, of cultural um, items, um, food, things like that. That's literally what this relationship was so many years ago. And I, it's important that I said this because I, I want everybody to understand that those who came here prior to Columbus, the majority of the time there was nothing, there was not about conquering land, it was an exchange between two people, two cultures. They had heard stories for years out of Europe about people being on the other side of the Atlantic Ocean. And they came here out of curiosity because they wanted to see who these people were. And when they got here, they were very surprised that these were kind, loving, and friendly people. This whole thing about race, that's, that's a social construct. That didn't come from, uh, as we know, white people, black people, anybody else. You know, it's all about economics, and that's where the division came in between all of us. Mm -hmm. And yes, race is definitely a new construct. It was something that did not exist prior to. And let's talk about the Vikings. The Vikings came here also. 
uh, about the 10th century, which was a thousand years ago, who also came here. Um, and from what I understand, they came to Newfoundland. Um, there's evidence of intermarriage between the Vikings mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and indigenous people. Um, and that recently they found bones of a Native American woman in, uh, I think it was Norway. Yeah. Like that. yeah. So it's very interesting. Um, I've brought some books here so we can definitely share some of that information with our audience afterwards and post uh, some things that you can listen to or read uh, regarding that. Now let's talk about this. This is very interesting because this is recent. Uh, the found evidence of the Chinese also actually visiting America. Um, we have Zhang He, who was a, a seafaring man who came right before Columbus or before Columbus, and he had a um, he had the globe of the world before Magellan did. So yeah. there's yeah. evidence of the Chinese actually intermingling and meeting with indigenous people. They recently found a stone that had what they thought were hieroglyphics on it, but they actually believed that it was ancient Chinese writing. Yes. You know, he came here 74, 71 years before Columbus. My good friend who is in spirit world now, Dr. Jack D. Forbes, who was an Indian from Virginia. And at the time that he lived, he became the go-to person about Native Americans. He actually founded the first Native American uh, university in California, University of Davis, Cal Southern California of Davis. And uh, a lot of our great Native people actually went there and graduated from there like Dennis Banks. Uh, and, you know, our history is so deep and intertwined that I think humanity or the, the human family need to stop making all these excuses about being related to each other. Um, this Admiral Zing He, he was a Muslim Chinese. Mm -hmm. And this man was so smart, you know? And and there's, there's a lot of stuff that, like the Irish, when Dr. Jack Forbes was invited to speak because he taught at the University of Southern Cal Davis, but he also was a, and professor at Oxford University. So he went to Ireland, Galway. And when he was teaching there, some of the professors there and, and archeologists were saying, we've got some things that only, we don't know where they came from. So can you please come and identify them? Well, he went there and he looked at the artifacts. He says, these are from the North American Indian people. So they have records of us traveling into Europe and setting up all kinds of uh, relationships and friendships and businesses. So this, you know, this this whole thing about racism, I wish they would just put that in a bag and mm -hmm. dump it in the ocean somewhere. Well, let's talk about that. We're gonna get to that, but we're primarily here to talk about the intersection between black and indigenous people. Let's talk about this. This is very significant. Uh, um, Mansa Musa coming here, the Mali Empire coming here. Mm -hmm. Can you kind of just uh, give us a little brief history on that? I think um, I would re I would prefer uh, either my friend Barry Lee or um, my new friend. Uh, who was it? Yeah, <laughs> I, would, I, would, I would like for him to comment on for them to comment on that. This will be give you a little bit of a background just in case so you all can have some context mm -hmm. here. So the Mali Empire actually came to what is now South America around 1311 AD, and which was 181 years before Columbus. Masa Musa was, had a net worth of over $400 billion. He was the wealthiest kingdom in Africa. And they, you know, uh, contrary to what is popular belief, this was a seafaring nation of people that actually constructed boats and traveled uh, along the Barren Strait and along the coast, two different nations carrying with them uh, items from their kingdom, gold spears and such, um, sweet potatoes, things mm -hmm. like that, the yam. So they came to the southern coast of, of America, and it was once again a cultural exchange of gifts, of items, and also intermarriage. 
Some of the sailors did not go back to Mali Empire. They actually stayed in South America and intermarried with the indigenous of South America. Mm -hmm. So a uh, Barry or a uh, Ron, please, please, you know, comment on that if you like. Well, I'll go first. And I'll, admittedly, I know very, very little about this. And so I really can't comment too much. Um, I, I have, I, you know, but it's always been that old, Oh, you take the look, say, take a look at Africa and see how it kind of fits right into South America, um, and how and everything it just looks like a suddenly an ocean came between them. But uh, I don't wasn't there at the time. I don't know, and but I I know very little. I heard something about like the, the Mali, but the Empire, but I know very very little about it. I apologize. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, that's why we're here to educate mm -hmm. ourselves and actually educate our audience members on this history. Ron, would you like to comment or Mary? Well, well, on, on, on the same note, I, I'm I'm somewhat uh, unaware of or unfamiliar with uh, with the the trade uh, uh, relationship. Uh, we do know that, and I think evidence continues to be uh, presented that uh, you know. Christopher Columbus was not uh, a, a person who discovered anything. Uh, he accidentally, you know, got lost and um, landed somewhere. But uh, we do what we what we do know is that is that uh, the indigenous communities on this continent and and the South American continent were were traders. They were they they they. Uh, they shared their goods and and they were uh, constantly looking for new markets uh, and and open to new markets they they uh, uh, what we find uh, from the south going north uh, we realize that the Asian uh, influence uh, has, has has been a constant uh, you know the, the trade routes uh, that were established uh, uh, thousands of years ago and continued right up to the European invert invasion or incursion uh, existed and there was merchandise that we that a European couldn't explain why they existed but I, I this is fascinating and I and I'm appreciating what I'm seeing right now what I'm here can I can I get in here for a second uh, I have my good friend Rick Tatum who's visiting us today along with his wife and he would like to make some comments about you know what happened back then too <clears throat> so let me introduce you to rick tatum rick this is my my television producer and good friend leslie fry so let me put him on rick. the board of roads hi mm -hmm. good evening good evening um, hey, rick. You brought up an interesting point about the west african um kingdom yeah. Can you move his camera just a little? Rick, can you move in just a little bit? Go ahead. Thank you. There, there, there were several kingdoms in West Africa that were aligned, and they did travel the world. They traveled the Mediterranean. They traveled to um, Northern Europe, and they traveled to the east coast of North and South um, America. So, yeah, it, it's it's documented. And again, it's a part of history that needs to be explored more Definitely. And, and, and be contextualized into what happened in the new world, because it, it just wasn't uh, a circumstance of the Western European, you know, coming to, you know, the new world and finding um, societies that they tried to subjugate, you know, so you, you you, you can find um, added as, as you move forward through through this discourse that you're going through. So it, it may be important to keep that point in mind as well. Thank you. All right, so let's just go talk about it. Uh, when the Europeans did come here, they found uh, 600 tribal nations, over 60 million people were here that were established way before uh, that. And uh, it's important that we're discussing this in particular because we were talking about phenotype. I want people to understand that this group of people that you see in this 
in this board right here or people that are in this particular show this evening on our educational series, you understand that we are all different variants of color. And that is similar to what we were back then. They were, we were um, people of different colors. So it's important that I'm talking about this specifically about phenotype because this is gonna come into play during the transatlantic slave trade, which we're gonna to get to as well as how we were misidentified. So I just want people to know that this is the representation of what they saw when they came here. Uh, these were Fox Indians from Wisconsin and understand the color of these individuals that were here. Yeah, they were part of the Sac and Fox Nation. Exactly. Um, <clears throat> so the, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, go ahead and, and briefly because I, I, we do still have some content to go through. We have a few more minutes. So I okay. just want to get through. We have a lot to get through. I think some of the numbers were wrong, and it's not your fault. When they came here <clears throat> to what is known as the United States of America, there were over 1,200 nations, established nations. And uh, in the first, I'd say, 100 years of coming here, they killed over 100 million Native American people. This is all fact and documented. And um, the treaties that they made with our nations were not designed to bring peace, but to steal land. And we, and we, 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 we need to just be a little more focused on what happened then. How do you kill 100 million people inside of the first 100 years? How do you do that and not feel any guilt about it? What's okay. interesting, too, is the idea of possession. Mm -hmm. uh, we as Indigenous people never possessed the land, but possession was a European ideology. And so coming in and possessing this land, taking over this land, was one of the reasons why they annihilated the people that were here. And there's many reasons why we could get into that. We could have a whole other show about mm -hmm. how, why we were annihilated. Uh, you know, I have my own personal beliefs about that as well. But uh, since we do have to go into a little bit more context about the intersection of black and indigenous people, that's definitely another show that we can have and we can have you come back and talk about that. Sure. So we were talking about primarily about race being a social construct and something that is kind of new. So I've actually found some newspaper clippings of people who came here before the transatlantic slave trade that were sold into indentured to. So you notice at the top one, if you can look at it, and let me see if I can bring this up a little bit. Um, it says that a Negro was supposed to be sold into indenture two. And then if you notice underneath that healthy German, if you see that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And then below that were other people who were Europeans that came here that had trades, specific trades that they did. Uh, blacksmiths, uh, tool makers, bricklayers and such. These were European European people who sold themselves into indigitude along with black people who came here from Africa and Canada um, that came in and sold themselves into indigitude. So essentially this these two groups of people were actually intermingling with one another. Uh, there was no 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 color there. So if you look before the mid 1600s, it was a combination of indigenous servants and European descent and African descent. So it was an intermingling of these people. Um, servitude was not hereditary. You basically, basically did a manuscript for maybe seven years and then you were, you bought out of your manuscript and you started your own business or something. So there was like a possibility of freedom over that. And Africans, Europeans that came here, all of them were part of a socioeconomic class. So money, have and have nots, was what defined Americans back in that time. But then when the transatlantic slave trade came about, this is when color became an issue. And it even started becoming more of an issue after that. Slaves could not own land. They didn't have rights. They never uh, were freed. And so people were being put into, a, I would say, more of a caste system in America during this time. True. 
So two of the people that we were talking about, we have George Bonga and someone who is very familiar to our American history, Crispus Attucks. And when I was going to school, I was told that Crispus Attucks was the first black man to die for America. No. But it all, and, and the truth here is that he was of indigenous heritage. He was black and indigenous, African American, as they say, and indigenous. So his father was a black man of mixed heritage, and his mother was, um, I believe. Um, I'm sorry, I can't really see this. Wampanoag. Um, she she was either Wampanoag or she was uh, Natick. She was Natick. Yeah. Yeah. New England Indians. Yeah. Exactly. New England Indians. Massachusetts Indians. Yeah. So this is the first representation, George Bonga, Crispus Attucks, of those of us who were of this mixed heritage. Um, and if you look at uh, this picture today, someone of, you know, because race is a new construct, you would identify these people as African American or Black. But these people mm -hmm. are of dual heritage or mixed heritage. Yes, yes, yes. So let's talk briefly about the Black Seminole Slave Rebellion and go into a little bit of context about that and the union between the Cimarron slaves, uh, the Maroon slaves, and the what we now know as the Seminole Nation in Florida. Um, Jay, can you kind of talk a little bit about that? Yeah, uh, the Seminole Nation in Florida when Thomas Jefferson, or was it Jefferson? Or, Andrew, yeah, Jackson. Andrew Jackson decided to go into what they call Florida to free the, the people that had fled there. They were, they were black people that had escaped slavery because they knew they had a haven to run to. And that was with the Seminole Indians. So when they got down there, uh, the U.S. cavalry that went in became gator bait, and that's what they used them for. And the Seminole Nation is the only nation that has never been defeated, according to U.S. history. Never been defeated. So the rebellion between, uh, so it was a combination of the Seminole and the Cimarrons, basically, uh, slaves who had escaped down to Florida when the U.S. Army was going down there they and the people that were trying to populate Florida at the time went down there. They basically, the, the natives knew how to navigate the land in Florida. And so you're saying when you say gator bait, they usually, they put them in certain pitfalls in order for them to die or fail. And it's interesting that you say this because there were about five or six slave rebellions during this time. But this yep. Black Seminole Rebellion lasted from 1816 to 1858. Yes, yes. And from what I understand, the U.S. Army um, lost like billions of dollars in this war against the Seminoles, in addition to over 6,000 people. And that doesn't include those people that went down there that were civilians died during this skirmish between uh, the the Seminoles and the U.S. Army Army. Yes, they were they were actually lost on what to do, and uh, they couldn't survive it. You know, I mean, if you go to Florida now, down in Seminole Country, you'll find that still at least fifty percent of the land is swampland, and there are alligators everywhere. So, um, Andrew Jackson made a big mistake. He was so arrogant and defiant. And he told the US government, well, I'm going down there anyway. But it was a combination of the, the English, the Spanish, and those of those, those people that they call Latinos, which is no such thing. There's no such thing as a Latino. Latin was the language that the Roman Catholic Church used to do their mis misleading people. Um, if you are from either what we know as North or South America, any of that, you are indigenous to this land. And if you go into South America, you'll find that they have chiefs and tribes just like we had since time immemorial. I have a lot of friends that happen to be labeled as Latinos, which I don't respect. 
that terminology. And uh, there's a lot to be had about this whole situation. Now, it's funny that you're saying that because uh, we have Ron here who is a Mexican heritage. And you told me something one time. You said there's no such thing as a Mexican, only indigenous people who speak Spanish. That's right. That's right. Um, because Mexico, Mexican is the name given by Europeans, but is uh, if you do um, a census take of, there are more indigenous people in Mexico than all over the world because the majority, the people there were indigenous. Yeah. So it's very interesting. So let's talk about Juan Caballo or John Horse, who was the leader of the Seminole Nation revolt uh, against the U.S. Now. He is a black and um, native heritage. A lot of people don't know about him. Uh, he's a very interesting figure. He actually fled to Mexico City uh, after this rebellion because they threatened his family. So they actually had to cede some of the land, unfortunately. But he was a very educated man. Once again, a man who walked between both worlds. Uh, he spoke both English and he spoke both um, his uh, native language. And he was, you know, he spoke also French. He was a really an interesting man. Um, but a lot of people don't know about this man. And he fled down to Mexico, which incidentally, too, Mexico had a policy where they did not believe in slavery. So there were a lot of slaves that ran to Mexico. If you do a DNA test of the majority of the Mexicans uh, in the um, in the country today, you will find that a large amount of them have African heritage as well as indigenous heritage. Yes, they do. Um, you know, the language of the Latin is the language of the conquerors. Because when they came here, the Spanish conquered everything. Juan Pardo and those guys, they came here and they conquered everything south of Tejas. The French and the uh, English and other people came from Europe. And they conquered, or they said they conquered, what is now known as North America. Mm -hmm. So if you really get into the deep history of it, and I wish we had more time, but there's a lot to this discussion that we need to continue to get into on a deeper level. Um, so let, and this yeah. is true, we might have to have a part two of this, but I kind of wanted to show mm -hmm. a US census of how people of mixed heritage were misidentified, in particular people of black and indigenous heritage. So I don't know if you can actually see this, but if you're looking at, um, let's see, the orange segment right there that says white, and it says free or non-free white, and then you notice that it just continues to say white. Then if you look, uh, I believe it is at, Below that might be purple, it says Indian. Are you all able to see this? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So may have to add this to post for everyone. But if you notice where it says black, it says black colored, black mulatto, mm -hmm. black mulatto, quadroon, octoroon. Okay, so let me explain this real quickly what this means. So people at that time, uh, most people identify as mulatto uh, as um, as people who have a white parent or and a black parent. But in actuality, mulatto was the name given to most people that were of mixed heritage that they could not identify what their heritage was. Mm -hmm. So if you notice when it comes to black people here in the United States, they went through a number of name changing until they became Negro and then African-American. So what it did is it eliminated anybody of mixed heritage and you were identified by phenotype by the U.S. Census and the census takers when they came by, which basically dissolved all of your native heritage and your European heritage if you had that. So it's very important that you see this because a lot of Black people here in the United States that are of African-American heritage are actually of indigenous heritage or mixed race heritage, um, but have been forced to classify as black well you know if you if you you want to know where it all started walter flecker started that in virginia when he became the uh, director of the census bureau uh if you were born a native american he would not that allow, allow that to be on your birth certificate you either either had to be white or colored 
not black, white or colored. Um, but I have something to interject on what we were talking about, the Latinos and the Mexican people. So where the hell did Geronimo come from? And what about Chief Victorio? Well, quite honestly, before those borders were established, they all came from the same place. Exactly, exactly. There were no borders. As, a, as there were no borders. Borders were put in place to control the flow of people and economics. No other reason. None. Oh, wow. Do you all have any comments? I, I'd love to hear from Barry and Ron just a little bit before we move on uh, uh, a little bit more about this. This is uh, just a, a fascinating discussion. I agree. I think we 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 really need to uh, open it up a little bit wider. If we hadn't, if we had the time to do it, I, I'm sure there's uh, um, there there are uh, subject matters that that uh, we all could contribute uh, our own experiences or knowledge with. We just don't have the time. Yeah. So I, let me just, go ahead. I really wonder, as, as I'm looking at the census, and I'm curious if I see a chart, I would love to see a chart like that, say, for England. It doesn't exist. It doesn't exist. Um, they may, I, I, they may, it may exist as far as the people that have migrated there, but um, the majority of that, yeah, would be would be white English, but yeah, it doesn't. I'd be curious about whether they they have a breakdown such as this in their because when it comes to uh, race, for lack of a better term, it's you could pretty much tell how a nation works just by seeing their popular culture, mm. and I have in the since with the wonderful thing of uh, fire stick and everything else, I'm able to get TV shows and watch TV shows, even from back in the 80s and 90s, uh, from France, England, and other countries. And in their casting and their storylines, they don't care. Yeah. It's only in the US that it seems to be a concern, which I yeah. find really fascinating. That's why I'd love to see if they even have that in their consensus or they didn't watch TV, they go just as far as male, female. That's about as far as it goes. Yeah, <laughs> it's we're we're. I think it's because we're such a young nation that, that could be. if you think if you think about how we were established and who we were established by, these these were penal colonies. So you have to think about the mentality of the people that came here that were outlaws in a sense. Yeah, the way that they thought. Uh, they were not as civilized as they would like to say that they were. They were not. Um, no, you no. know, now, let's not take away from the fact that it was the Europeans that started all of this. But at some point, you know, they gave up the ghost on it. Uh, and now it's something that we perpetuated. Okay. Yeah. So, so we know that, uh, the you know, Spanish uh, uh, definitely, uh, uh, as they entered the... Uh, the, what they called the new world, uh, they brought along with them a, a caste system. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you uh, I look into the various uh, uh, countries in South America, Central and South America, that caste system still exists. But that that uh, method of identifying the indigenous uh, uh, purity to the white purity. Um, uh, I, I think it had some influence on what on where we where we uh, in this nation uh, uh, went in in creating those identifications. I mean, caste systems exist uh, existed then and 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 now uh, throughout the the world. Oh, I, I and they are shared. It's it seems like they were more concerned with economic caste. Well, it, it, it was economics because then the race tied into economics. Mm -hmm. Who could own property? Who could not own property? That's basically what happened. So it's all been about, mm -hmm. and it's interesting because you think that it is about race, but at the end of it all, on the underlying component here is that it's about money and property. Yep. It's That's always fair. been. I would and, agree. Who, and who they could get to do the work free. Yes. Yes. Well, it's so um, <laughs> Tracy said the doctrine of discovery empowered Europeans to feel justified in colonizing genocide. And this is quite true exactly. because they had, to, they had to justify what they were doing. It was horrific. 
Yeah. yeah we'll, to, and so we'll have, we will have a discussion on, on the, the doctrine of discovery in, uh, in, in one of our uh, upcoming series. Yes, we will. And we can get a little bit more in depth about that. Mm -hmm. So let me move on very quickly. We have about 10 minutes. Um, so I want to talk specifically about the five civilized tribes. And these were the Cherokee Choctaw, the, the Muscogee Creek, the Chickasaw, and the Seminole. Now, these are people who were in what I call the southern states of the United States. And these are people that, these are groups of, uh, of na uh, natives or tribes that had basically acclimated to European ways, even to the full extent of having slaves. Now, it was not as horrific as we would know slavery is today. Uh, it was more of indentured where they had slaves that that lived with them for about seven years, and then they were allowed to marry into the tribes uh, and into the community. They were inducted into the community. And it's very important that we talk specifically about them because there are issues today underlying the mixed race people from these communities. So let's go on a little bit uh, further. I have one comment to make about that. Yes. Uh, out of 1,200 nations that were already here before the Euro European invaders came here, it's only five nations that are civilized. Come on. So, so these understand that the name the name was given civilized because they had adapted to European culture. Understand that was not the name we gave ourselves. No. That was the name that the Europeans gave them because they 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 adopted Christianity. They adopted Southern ways. And, and I want also to, to comment on the fact that the reason why these tribes adopted that is because the Southern nations were being pressed upon by Europeans. And in order for them to keep their land, they went ahead and they just agreed to whatever was going around there so that they could keep their land. You know, I don't want anybody to think that they were turncoat or anything, but this is the only way. These tribes also had a small group uh, a tribe in, compa in comparison to other tribes. They were very small, especially the Choctaw Nation, who actually joined the Southern, um, joined the, um, the, 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 the rebel army, I'm sorry, with the, the, the South during the Civil War because their numbers were so low. And that came back to haunt them later once they were pushed into Oklahoma. So let's go on a little bit. So like I said, they actually had slaves and when they were pushed to oklahoma by andrew jackson here again we're going to come back to andrew jackson again because he just never got over the fact that he lost the war mm -hmm. and so he was in charge of seeding all of these natives pushing them out of their homelands and moving them into oklahoma um so this is why we know the majority of what are now the slide the five civilized tribes are now living in oklahoma the cherokee Choctaw, chickasaw Ch uh, creek nations and they took along with them their slaves. In fact, uh, their slaves were people that helped them survive on this path uh, because they were they these slaves knew how to cult, to do the to to forage for particular food and stuff like that. We lost so many of our people on this trek in the middle of the winter, five thousand miles on foot. They went to Oklahoma, and when they got there understand that if you are the um the traditional steward of a particular type of land you're familiar with that particular land they were unfamiliar with this land the land was rocky it was hard um it didn't it didn't uh produce any any um you know food or anything like that it did and, produce however oil so, and freezing, freezing temperatures yes yeah, freezing people, temperatures. these people came from warm states they yeah. didn't know what it, what it was like to try to survive in walking in feet of many feet of snow. They yeah. didn't have what it took to survive. We lost so many people. And, Andrew, and that and that fool Andrew Jackson knew it. Yeah, he thought it, it was definitely a genocide walk. But what has happened now is because racism has now infiltrated these communities. Um, oh yeah. When land was over, when land was seeded and now oil was found on this land, there were people that were trying to get on what we call the Dawes Road Commission. Uh, and the Dawes Road, let me say to tell you, this was a commission that was set up by white European uh, people to identify if you were Indian enough to have land in Oklahoma. Uh, they were the ones to determine if you were Indian enough. 
Uh, this my great great grandfather was affected by this, even though he was indigenous, uh, he was not given land because I think personally, after reading the dolls role, he was married to a black woman and they weren't going to have it. But there were people that actually it was so nefarious. This white board deciding if you were indigenous and indigenous enough, there were people that were actually paying their way to get onto this to this dolls role in order to have land in Oklahoma. And now with more and more people being on that land, that land being a, a, a wealth of oil, the indigenous population is now determining who is therefore Indian enough, they themselves are Indian enough to have this land. So they're ki kicking out people that they call the freemen people. And these are people who are the indigenous um, descendants of the, the slaves that they had, telling them that they're not Indian. And so this is part, this has caused a huge point of contention within uh, the community because racism somehow infiltrated our nations when there was never a question of color. It was always about who you belong to, what nation you belong to was never about color. However, the Cherokee Nation eliminated these bylaws recently and now you could just determine by your heritage if you are Cherokee enough to join, but they are the only tribe that has done that. You know, when uh, Chief, uh, not Chief, but when Smith was the so-called Chief of the Cherokee Nation, I guess about seven, eight years ago, I went up against him because I had Dr. Jack D. Ford, Tex Hall, the Chief of the Three Affiliated Tribes, and a bunch of other people on a radio broadcast. And their question to him was, Tex asked me, see, well, how do you get rid of your people? He said, well, they're freemen, freedmen. And I had the uh, president of the Freemen's Association on that show too. And one of the things that Jack Forbes said to him was, um, what was it, Smith? His name was Smith. He said, Chief Smith, if you shake your family tree, you're going to be surprised at who jumps out. It's and he was, trying, he was trying to eliminate all of the freedmen's Indians that had black blood before there was the Trail of Tears, when there was just the Cherokee Nation on the East Coast. Those people had intermarried in the tribe for hundreds of years. So how do you go and try to purify this? You know, it's the same thing that Adolf Hitler tried to do, the Aryan nation. Just think about it. This is all by habit of what they've done over these years. So I, I and we, we definitely want to talk about that because there's more to that story that we want to talk about. I have to bring you back and talk about that particular okay. story. But you told me one time that Chief Billy Tyak said something to you about who is Native American. And so I found something that said that Native Americans are the people who contain blood of the one or more than 500 distinguished tribes that still endure and exist as sovereign and unsovereign states <coughs> within the United States today. Yeah, These are the descendants of those who are pre-Columbian indigenous people of North America. So that basically says that if you contain that blood, you still contain the memory the hopes, the desires of the indigenous people that were there. It's just up to you to decide if that is something that you're going to pursue. And right. I, want to, I want to personally say something here. One of the reasons why this is so very important to me is once again, I'm going to go back to my grandfather being um, trying to be on the dolls row. I am of Choctaw heritage, but he was denied that because he wasn't Choctaw enough to someone else's standards. It didn't say that he was not indigenous. It just said, no, that he was not gonna be able to claim land. But here's the thing, if I don't claim that side of my heritage, then I am completely breaking off a whole part of my identity that lives here. That means I will forget my grandmother. I have to forget my grandfather, his mother. The nation, the world is telling me I must forget them. And it is a type of genocide to say that I have to walk on and be something else instead of claiming who I really am. Uh, we have about one minute before our eight o'clock mark. Can we go ahead, uh, Elder Nightwolf? Do you have something real quick to say? 
when I had Chief Billy Tayak on my show, he was the chief of the Piscataway Indian Nation of Maryland. And I asked him, I said, Uncle Billy, who is an Indian? And his definition was an Indian is one who carries the sacred ancient blood of the Western hemisphere in his or her vein. He said, if you don't have that blood, he said, if you got that blood, then you're an Indian. If you don't have that blood, you belong to a special tribe called the Wanabi tribe. I said, what is that? He said, <laughs> I love that story. No. <laughs> so quickly, I'm going to show some photos of people who are uh, Native American. And if you look at them, you would say that they look African American, but they are actually um, Native American people, Crow tribesmen, Algonquin people. These are these are photos that were taken of people that have been misclassified or identified as something else. Now, mind you, when those natives were pushed to Oklahoma, a lot of our people intermingled with the African Americans or the Black people of America today because they were being hunted. Uh, if they did not go to Oklahoma, they were being hunted for their scalps, and that's a whole nother story that we can get into. But so it was easier for them to say that they were black than to say that they were native for fear of being killed. That's right. They had a price on Indian scalps back then. And a lot of people that were native would not admit to being native because the U.S. government would pay their government agents $100 for a man's scalp, $50 for a woman, and $25 for children from infancy to adolescency. So that's why they said, no, I'm not Indian. I'm black. And it's very interesting because, like I said, there was never an issue of color here. These two girls right here are, um, I believe they may be sisters. Yes. They both yeah. have to see their sisters. Um, they're sisters. And, and you would see one, one of them looks darker than the other. But these two girls are sisters of the same tribe. But nobody made a difference between who was of color and who was of not. Mm hmm and there are many of us that have this heritage that have now been classified as black. Uh, the Jackson Five or Cherokee, of course, we know Billy Hendrix, Billy, Billy, Billy uh, uh, Hendrix. Jimmy. Jimmy. Jimmy Hendrix, sorry, sorry, yes, yeah, sorry, Jimmy Hendrix. Wrong generation, kid. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm thinking Billy Preston, I'm thinking on them. Um, Tina Turner, Tina Turner. Tina Turner is Choctaw. There's a lot of people that you know, the Neville brothers of Choctaw, a lot of people who have been identified as black are actually of native heritage. And James Brown was Apache. Yep, James Brown was actually Apache, believe it or not. Yep. So a lot of a lot of us have share in this heritage. Oh yeah. So what you see as someone who is represented as, as African American or black here in the United States. You need to look a little deeper because in there is native heritage. Yes, yes. Can I say thank you, uh, Leslie, for doing this tonight? Because this is so important and we need to do follow-ups. Definitely, definitely. Um, I will, Tracy, I will um, put in post for everyone some of the books that you can refer to. Mm -hmm. uh, to educate yourselves a little bit more. And we could continue discussion maybe later on uh, because there's so much more uh, context that we can go into. So before we close, I would like to get any comments from uh, Ron, Elder Ron and Mary and Mary and Tracy, if she's able to speak. Well, it's been a, it, 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 it's been an enlightening uh, uh, series. Unfortunately, we don't have the time to, to really delve into uh, an entirety of the subject matter, but uh, does that sound like uh, gobbledygook? It isn't. I really enjoyed uh, uh, Jay. I enjoyed uh, your presentation, and uh, Leslie, you fascinate me. Your your awareness and your and your continuing uh, growth uh, on the subject matter is is just overwhelming, and it's been a really interesting uh, series. Uh, I could not ha do this without having people to embrace me to find out a little bit more. So I have to thank you, uh, Elder Nightwolf, Barry, Tracy. Uh, I couldn't do this and I'm, I couldn't be on this path of growth and knowledge without you all. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. 
So in post uh, this evening, I will put some of this there for any of the, our audience members who want to look at some footage. I highly recommend there is a movie that I'll put a link to called uh, Black Indians, an American Story. Um, that is just amazing. It is narrated by James Earl Jones, who is also of indigenous heritage. And I highly in recommend Cherokee. it. In Cherokee. Yeah, in Cherokee, that you can, you can watch it on YouTube. Mm -hmm. And it'll give you a little bit more context about that intersection. So right. thank you, you all, for joining us this evening. Our next um, Roti series will be on the powwow, which is coming in May. So we're very excited about that. And what up, Jay? No, no, no. April 22nd is the next series. April 22nd is the next series where we're going to be talking about the powwow in that series. Okay, I thought, yes. Yeah. Yes. yes. <laughs> so, uh, so I'm very excited about that because it's going to be a very interesting, interesting discussion. And I, I would like to say that I did not start our meeting this evening with our land acknowledgement, so I must apologize for that. I was a little frazzled. Um, but we do normally start our series with land acknowledgement. Um, and so before we end our series this evening, I'm going to do our land acknowledgement to sign off. Okay. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you, um, everyone. We're looking forward to seeing you back here at the end of uh, Thursday, April the 22nd, which is the last Thursday of the month for our next Road Tie educational series. Thank you. <laughs>